The Holy Gospel according to John, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Tonight's readings, there's a lot that happens on Maundy Thursday, and often we focus on the gospel, but tonight I want to focus on our reading from Corinthians. And so um, we'll be talking mostly about that reading. Um, but I do want to acknowledge, this is a holiday, acknowledge that this is a holiday weekend. I'm sure there will be lots of celebrations. We have a big one on Saturday with a fun Easter egg hunt and all sorts of candy and, and fun. And often on holiday weekends, we gather for a meal. So what do you do for Easter? Do you gather with family? Do you go out to eat? Do you go to someone's home? Is it like your other holiday meals or is it more low-key? When I was growing up, Easter was just as important as Thanksgiving and Christmas in, in my family. And honestly, until I became a youth minister and was in charge of egg hunts and Easter breakfasts and all sorts of other things, Easter was my favorite holiday. <laughs> What's your favorite holiday meal and why? I'm going to give you just a moment to think about that meal. What is your favorite holiday meal and why? What does it mean to you, and why is it special? Now, with the picture of that meal in mind, what would it be like if someone very special to you, maybe someone who's usually there, maybe not, but what would it be like if that person couldn't be there, or they weren't invited, or now they're missing from this meal. What would you do? How would you feel? Would you mourn? 
Would you worry? Would you call them? Would you feel bad if you'd forgotten to invite them or maybe angry if someone else had forgotten to invite them? What would you do and how would you feel? In today's New Testament reading, Paul confronts the people of Corinth about the Lord's Supper. In fact, 1 Corinthians is a letter of Paul admonishing the Corinthians because they're being divisive and they are divided. And so the topic for today's particular admonishment is the Eucharist. And you might recognize the words from the specific passage that we read tonight from our communion liturgy. And so, it, but it might not make much sense to read just three, these three verses to understand this, this full meaning of what Paul's conveying to the people. This why is he sharing this really lovely piece with us, and what does it mean in light of divisiveness? So I want to go back and actually start from verse 17 instead of 23. And I want to fill you in on the verses just before Paul talks about the institution of the Lord's Supper. Paul writes, Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you came, come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Indeed, there have to be, have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you proceeds to eat your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have households to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. So in these verses, 17 through 22, Paul is addressing the way that communion is being practiced as, as, long, as much as he has heard from afar. The abuses and the ways that the people are using it to gain more uh, status or to revel and have a party rather than reflect on what it really is all about. He's disappointed and a little angry probably with the people of Corinth because they're not treating this gathering for communion as a holy and welcoming meal, but they're treating it as a place for status and divisiveness. People are leaving without having been fed. People are getting drunk. He claims in verse 20, when you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. Sound familiar? Uh, to me, these sound a little like the words of all the prophets in the Old Testament over and over and over with the Israelites. Unfaithful generation, punishment will come, etc., etc. Even after Christ's death and resurrection, the people could not remain faithful to the words and actions of Christ by themselves. They could not practice communion in the way that it was meant to be practiced, I dare say even we cannot do that often in our own day and time. We live in a divided world where if you don't believe as another does, you are cast out or ignored or at worst harmed. We live in a time when we seem to be stuck because even when we agree that something needs to be done, for instance, to protect our children or help the poor, or love our neighbors, we can't seem to agree on how, so we just go on staying divided and mad. We are often happy with our status, and may even take the time to think of others, but how often do we do that, and what do we do about it? While we go out into the world to help, how often do we invite people in, into our lives, and into our homes, into our church, and into this meal of communion. Brian Peterson of Lutheran Southern Seminary writes, to properly discern the body at the table means that we cannot come while leaving others uninvited and unwelcomed or without mourning their absence. We cannot leave the table and be content to leave anyone hungry. 
In other words, while we are nourished and fed at this meal, do we also mourn those who aren't here? Do we seek to invite those uninvited or forgotten? Do we make sure there's enough for all? Do we even remember that these people are are someone special who have a place at the table too? So these are important things to ponder as we listen to Paul's words detailing the true institution of the Lord's Supper. And that second part of the verse sounds like this. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, which would have been the tradition or the passing on, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Hard words, and yet there is good news for us. Not to make us forget Paul's earlier words in verses 17 through 22, but these are good words that provide us with the knowledge that we do not invite or welcome those missing without God's help. When we take communion, Peterson also says we become what we receive and consume. The body of Christ for the sake of the world. The story of the supper is the story of God's grace at work beyond any human betrayal. It is God's love handing over Jesus on the cross and then our hands and our mouths and then through us into the world. Paul's words for us tonight remind us also that our action of betrayal of God is superseded by God's action of love and mercy. As we betray God and hand Jesus over to death, This is a death that he freely accepted. This past Sunday, we recalled that even though the people welcomed Jesus with chants of hosannas and palms, Jesus knew what was coming. And yet Jesus entered the city and rode towards his death willingly as an act of grace and mercy. And this is what the communion meal celebrates. Acts of mercy and grace And a meal of love that is intended for you, for us, for those we have forgotten, and those who need to be brought to the table as well. Paul reminds the people of Corinth and us, the people of today, that the communion meal is not to divide, but it's a meal to unite. And it's made so by the death of Christ to make room for all God's people in the new covenant in Christ's blood. We are unfaithful. We forget or exclude others. We betray Christ. But because of this, God has made a new covenant for us, a new covenant in Christ's blood. And this new covenant we celebrate tonight in the communion meal. We celebrate with all those past, all those present, and all those in the future that God's grace and love and mercy are for all to unite us in one heavenly food, in the body of Christ for this world. Who will we invite to this meal? What must we change or how must we change to make sure others are welcomed? Have we made sure that there is enough for all? God, shower us with your grace and mercy tonight so that when you share your heavenly body with us, we may take it with us out into the world because of your sacrifice and love. Amen.